Hello, everybody. So today we will we'll be hearing about socially aware applications to PageRank for the real world. So it's going to be about computing technology that is uh, sensitive to human attention. And the, and the speakers will be Professor Royal Vertical and a master student, Jamie Hart from Queen's University in Canada. We live in a world of noise, of confusion. Information is everywhere, yet nowhere to be found. We lead scattered existences, surfing channels of life through email, to cell phone, to instant messages. And in my quest to find Somewhere down the line, we did not lose our ability to focus. But it seems we maybe lost our ability to focus on the right things. It seems the instant has become the message. Now this video will show that this has dire consequences. Gary? Uh, super idea with a TV and a cell phone, Carl. You're fired. Hmm? What? So maybe not. Let's do a little experiment. I'm going to show you a slide, and I'm going to ask you to count the red squares on that slide. Ready? Go. All right, how many blue circles were there on that slide? Um, this little experiment shows us that we are very capable of directing our attention at certain stimuli. And when we do so, we actually filter out information from the real world. Now, let me tie this back to a couple of problems that exist, I believe, in, in computing today. First of all, with the advent of a more ubiquitous computer, we now have too many computers. So every two years, the number of computers will double. And increasingly, these computers are networked around the globe, serving as information appliances, connecting us to social networks. And that means we're always connected and always on and always available for disruption of our work. And the second problem is that computers have become simply too much. Here we see uh, a pretty standard spec sheet on, in this case, a Palm 1 device, which shows um, 26 features, um, including um, a messaging button, application button, a customizable button, which is even cooler. But how do I make a call? The third problem is that Computers are unsociable. They're basically designed to be operated with the user in full control. And human-computer interaction, the H in human-computer interaction, could sometimes be perceived to be standing for hands, hands-computer interaction. But what happens in a, in a day and age where computers themselves become communication appliances is that they lead a life of their own. And I don't know when the last time was you had a conversation with your screwdriver, but they're not very good at it. Simply enter or change your information on our automated registration card. When you finished, please make sure that you are connected to the internet and then click the register me button below. I will automatically register you. What a fresh perspective. So inattentive agents can be a real pain. And what I would like to suggest is that we need to actually start paying attention in design to attention itself. Each appliance today still dominates attention as if it were your personal computer, as if it were the only thing you had. And there's very poor coordination or no coordination whatsoever between appliances. So if you're in a conversation, your cell phone will ring happily not knowing you're in a conversation, and your emails will keep popping up. So the way to fix this is by having appliances pay attention to what we do and sense when we're available and when we're busy and decide how important their message really is. Now this ties into a separate notion that we live in an economy of attention. Attention indeed is the fabric of our economy according to Goldhaber. 
customers buy and sell attention, and technology dominates that attention and stands in the way, distorts that economy. However, technology can also measure attention, and that will be the topic of my talk today. So PageRank at Google is a great example of how the world's economies rely on user attention. PageRank more or less measures user attention by examining, amongst others, how much conscious attention a page has received, for example, by counting links towards it. And this measure has revolutionized the online search business. And part of our effort has been to find an equivalent measure for real-world interaction with customers. So let's go back to attention itself. What is attention? Well, you could say it's the mind's operating system. The human mind is limited in what it can process and in its allocation of resources. And the term attention refers to the way it allocates processing resources through focusing of mental effort in a way that's selective, shiftable, as well as divisible. And this happens as early as right in the eye. We see here a picture of the, uh, the human eye with uh, the retina at the back. And what we see there is a, dark, a red spot, uh, which we call the fovea. Now, the information that's being processed in the fovea is, is of much higher resolution than anywhere in peripheral vision. Um, so there's um, a real drop off of resolution outside that two to five degree area. And that means we need to move our eyes in order to focus things and in order to filter things. And one question you can ask, is that something that occurs because of stimuli in the real world or because of thoughts we have internally? And the answer is both. Here's a very, very famous study done by Yarbus in 1967 that shows that if you ask a different question, for example, uh, do these people know each other? Uh, how long has this person been away? Or can you remember their clothing? You get very, very different eye movement patterns, which you see uh, plotted there for various questions. So attention is a fabric that connects the outside world to our brain, and it's influenced both by our brain and by the outside world. And without it, we're in deep trouble. Now, I'll show you two pictures. And the question is, what's the difference between the two pictures? I'll uh, point it out. Did anyone notice that big engine dropping off the plane there? Well, if you're an aircraft inspector, you're in trouble, because you've just missed a very, very important defect of that plane. So how can you measure attention? Well, here's the current state of the art. It's the Toby 1750 tracker that is also deployed here at Google in order to study the usability um, of, uh, of page layout design and how people uh, use information in queries. And um, it's, it's a highly problematic device. Eye tracking has always been highly problematic. This thing doesn't work over 60 centimeters. Uh, users have to sit still within a 20 centimeter radius. It requires calibration for each user, so the system is not walk up and use. You can't just sit behind it and it will work. It costs $25,000 US. Um, and about 10 years ago, we thought, this is silly. We need to do something about this. Uh, you know, there's no need for these devices to be that expensive. And there should be ways in which we can make this technology calibration free, walk up and use and deploy them in everyday use scenarios like as if it were a mouse for the real world. So in communication too, eyes reveal the attention of others. And this cue is used to a great extent. Eyes show who talked to whom, and they show interest that in a way that does not interfere with speech. And as such, it's a critical cue in group conversations. And we've done uh, a lot of empirical studies in this, in this area showing that by and large, whom you look at correlates with whom you listen to and whom you speak to. So I'm going to show you an excerpt from one of the experiments we did. Um, this was an experiment we did in 1997, uh, showing four people. You only see three. The fourth person is seated where you are. Um, and what you see is the measurements we took from the fourth individual that you don't see. So you see on the top there where this person was looking. This is the fovea. And in the bottom, you see uh, lights that indicate a score that was taken after the conversation asking whom were you listening to or whom were you speaking to. And what we'll notice is that these two measures are almost entirely correlated. So right now he's listening to her. 
En hij switcht naar hem. Nee, precies. Dat misschien in, in andere sectoren misschien wel, maar Schiphol is... Tenminste, wat ik heb begrepen is Schiphol gewoon te blijven. En als deze guy start speaking, he indicates attention for all three. But the eye movements become distributed because of selective attention. You have to look at either one person or the next. And you get this typical iterative pattern. And what you also see is people look more in that scenario. So this brought us to think more carefully about that tunnel that lies between people when they communicate that we can't see behave much like this individual who intrudes because he doesn't notice the ongoing conversation. Oh, uh, what's the email address? I'm talking wrong right now. Oh, sorry. Like people, ubiquitous computers should sense social interactions before interrupting. People move in and out of each other's focus of attention all the time. Via proximity, body orientation, or even eye contact, we regulate our spheres of communication. Aura Mirror is an art piece that tries to capture this process. It is a video mirror that paints the bubbles of attention that people have standing in front of the mirror on top of their reflections. It uses computer vision to detect when people are talking to each other and when they're looking at the mirror and discussing the art piece. When they are talking to each other, their bubbles merge. The irony being that when they look back at the mirror to discuss this, it pops. All right, so we took these principles and thought about how could we apply them to user interface design. We came up with five uh, different ways in which attention can apply to user interface design. This was published in uh, Communications of ACM in two th April 2003, um, special issue on attentive user interfaces. So first of all, interfaces need to show users' attention. Second of all, they need to think about the user's attention and reason about that attention resource. Thirdly, they need to sense user attention in order to know where that attention lies. Fourthly, they need to negotiate user attention um, and encourage a kind of turn-taking turn process, particularly when uh, it's not entirely clear what the user wants. And finally, you can actually augment user attention um, by actually increasing the resources that are available to the human and uh, essentially allowing a computer to take over part of the attentive process of the user. And I'll be giving some examples of each of these categories of enhancement. Now, first of all, this is nothing new. Uh, this is a fairly famous picture called the Mona Lisa. It was, pictured, uh, it was uh, painted a while ago. Um, and one of the controversies over this picture has been uh, why is uh, it so ambiguous? Why is it so attractive? What's going on here? And um, very often you hear the story that Mona Lisa is an interesting picture because she makes eye contact with you wherever you stand. But that's true for any picture where the person is looking at the lens of the camera. So that can't be it. If we look a little bit closer at the eyes of the Mona Lisa, we notice that she's actually not looking at you. She's looking off to the right, except it's a bit of an ambiguous cue because her head is off to the other side. Now, if we do a Fourier analysis of this, we actually see that this ambiguity leads to eye contact perception in very, very low resolution cases, such as on the left. And we can see that there's no eye contact in high resolution cases, such as on the right. Now, at the same time, there's something funny going on with the mouth. Um, and this is work that's been done um, a while ago at a, at a different uh, American university, where they try to filter the uh, smile and see how it affected perception of that smile. And what we see is that the very, very fine use of brush strokes in the smile um, are essentially not seen when you're looking at the eyes. And the smile disappears when you're looking um, at the eyes. When you're looking at the mouth, however, you can see the smile very, very clearly. Now, conversely, when you look at the eyes, she's not making eye contact. When you look at the smile, because of foveal resolution and low resolution in peripheral vision, she appears to be making eye contact. You're essentially seeing the image on the left. And so when you're looking at the smile, she's making eye contact, she's smiling at you. She likes you. When you look at the eyes, she stopped looking at you. In fact, she looks just, just to the right of you, which is particularly annoying. And she stopped smiling. What is she doing? She's playing hard to get. 
So this is the first attentive display in recorded history, and it required no technology other than brush strokes. Here's another attentive technology, the graphical user interface. This is the first graphical user interface running on the Xerox Alto in 1973. This is Bravo, the text editor. And what we see here is that windows are all about attention. Windows are there for a focused task. You see everything in high resolution, whereas icons are there for peripheral vision. And they're usually on the side of the screen. And they are either future or past tasks that you can open up and increase the resolution of. Now, someone called Rick Bolt at MIT um, caught on to this in the early 80s and designed some really, really interesting interfaces uh, that were, by and large, mock-ups because the technology to do them for real didn't exist at the time. Here we see Rick with a, a self-built um, eye tracker in his glasses and a video wall containing uh, 20 TV stations that would basically select their audio the moment you look at these uh, TV screens. And that allowed a kind of cocktail phenomenon, a kind of cocktail melange style browsing of TV channels. All right, so back to our principles. So first of all, to show attention. We've done a lot of work in um, video conferencing, um, and this is arguably one of the more state-of-the-art video conferencing systems on the market today, the Apple Eye side with the uh, iChat conferencing environment. And what we see here is that this person is staring down, and the reason for that is that there's a large parallax between where the camera is and where the eyes are represented on the screen. So when the camera is not exactly where the eyes of the remote individual are, that remote individual will not perceive eye contact, and that entire cue for turn-taking is broken. And that means that in group conversations, turn-taking efficiency goes down by about 25%, and this is the sole reason why you can't do telephone conferences, why during telephone conferences, you need to have someone who manages the floor for you. If you show as much as a still picture with eye contact at the appropriate times, you can manage the conversation, and video does very little to enhance it. So here's a system we built called Gaze 2. This was done um, in 2002, which shows um, essentially a windowing environment uh, like iChat, where the windows flip and rotate to indicate whom you're looking at. And this was measured with an eye tracker built into the screen. Um, video feeds were selected from cameras that were positioned behind the screen using a silver, half-silvered mirror solution such that we could always select a camera that provided eye contact, and then we would rotate that image towards the person you were looking at. We could also do cocktail party filtering techniques, such as enhancing the resolution of the person you've been looking at the longest, or enhancing the audio of the person you're looking at the longest. All right, reasoning about attention. There's been a lot of work done at Microsoft by um, Eric Horvitz, amongst others, um, on this problem, and uh, Eric came up with this um, Bayesian solution, uh, which was featured in a special issue on uh, these technologies of Scientific American in 2005. What we see here is various scenarios, such as, for example, a meeting where a person gets an email from a boss to her inbox, but the inbox doesn't notify until the appointment with the job candidate is ended. In another scenario, maybe the system senses that the person is at her PC uh, composing an email and will wait until that email is done before notifying uh, on the screen. And in another scenario, maybe uh, you're mobile, and the system notices that you're mobile, and it'll forward the notification to your uh, BlackBerry or, or other mobile device. But it's very, very complicated. And moreover, if you don't know what the person is doing in terms of sensing stuff in the real world, then what you can do is very, very limited. All you can do is reason about calendar appointments that may or may not be real. And you don't know, for example, whether there are people in the room that a person is having a conversation with and who they are. And so this is the area where we uh, put a large research effort in to sense attention. So how can you sense attention? Well, the eye trackers that um, I talked about um, are very, very good in terms of um, sensing attention towards a display very, very accurately. You can pinpoint where a user is looking on the display within about one to two centimeters. However, many of these ubiquitous circumstances, you need something different. And if we look back at communication and how humans do it, we see that humans really aren't interested in where you look. They're interested in whether you look at them or not. They're not even interested in where other people look. The only cue that's available to them for turn taking is actual eye contact with the other person. And so we designed sensors that mimic that behavior. And the cool thing about that is you do not require a coordinate space and you do not require calibration. So how does this work? 
Well, a camera has, an infrared camera has um, infrared lights associated that are uh, placed on axis with the camera lens. When these flash, the retina will flash back. This is true for all mammals. Um, in order to increase night vision, the retina will essentially amplify the uh, incoming light and bounce it back towards wherever it came from, which in this case is where the camera is as well. So in the camera, you'll see this image on the right, which is a bright pupil effect. Uh, and we all know this as the red eye effect in photos that we so desperately try to get rid of. What we also see is a corneal glint. This is essentially an indicator of where the camera is um, on the mirror surface that is the cornea. Uh, and so when these two correspond, you know that the person is looking at the camera. It's that simple. In order to find the eyes, you have another set of lights, which are set off axis. And what's really cool about this is the light may still bounce out of the eye if it does reach it out of the eye. It certainly does not go back into the camera, because it'll flash back to wherever the lights were. And so what we see here is exactly the same image, but now we're seeing it as a dark pupil. Subtract the two images, and what you've just done is found the pupils. And this works very, very robustly. It's in, in hardware subtraction. All right, so with this technology, we set about and created a number of consumer appliance technologies that solve certain problems we believed were due to the lack of knowledge or sensing capability of human attention. And one of the categories is called eye appliances, and these are essentially any kind of appliance with an eye sensor mounted on top. What you see here is a light appliance with an eye contact sensor on top. And in working with these appliances, human group communication is used as the chief metaphor. So you don't use the eyes to press buttons. You simply use the eyes to indicate open or closed communication channels. And then the hands or the voice may provide the commands. So here's what happens if you don't do that. Turn on the TV. Not that one, this one. Turn on the TV by the fan. Maybe not. On, turn it off. On, turn it off. So now the lamp is no longer listening to me because I'm no longer looking at it. On, turn it off. The reason this lamp knows that I'm talking to it is because it's got this eye contact sensor on top of it uh, that scans my eyes all the time and it can tell the lamp that I'm currently looking at it, and then the lamp's speech recognition engine decides I'm talking to it, just like it should. This is the eye contact sensor mounted on top that allows it to tell that I'm looking at it. And you can do the same thing with the phone. They've also designed an attentive phone. It may look more like Elmo, but I assure you it is a phone, and it won't disturb you by ringing. Instead, it will search for your eyes, and once it's established eye contact, it will simply put the call through. Hi, Roel. What's up? Have you taken a look at the proofs for the article? Um, yeah, it looks good. Yeah, you don't think we should change figure one? Okay, what do you suggest? I don't know. Well, well, let's get together and have a look. Sure, okay. Bye. Bye. So now the appliance loses eye contact, it starts scanning and then drops the call. You can do the same thing with home theater appliances. The problem with traditional remote controls, such as this universal remote control, is that they have too many buttons. They become very complicated, and they might get stuck in a modality. For example, I might be controlling the DVD player, and then when I want to control the TV, um, the remote control doesn't work at all. So let's get rid of it. We might use a mouse, but the problem with the mouse is I need a surface to move it on, and I also need to specify some kind of directionality. What is it controlling? So let's get rid of it. Instead, we're using a single button remote control, and we're using our eyes to specify where that single button goes to. What we see here is an attentive display with a number of LEDs associated with panes of content in the display. There's a camera here that is basically focusing on my eyes and seeing what kind of corner of the display I'm looking at. And all this is completely calibration free and no wires attached. So let's look at um, pane number two here, which is streaming some content from Apple. Now, if I click the remote here, it'll simply blow up that pane, and I have a TV that's just focused on that content. Click again, and it's back. Now let's go to pane number four, which is playing The Office. 
And uh, the moment I look at the pane, I can hear the content. If I go to pane number one, which is streaming some content from ABC, the sound goes to that stream, or maybe pane number three here, playing a Bowie concert that I went to, and we can listen to the Bowie concert. So let's blow that up, and now I want to see uh, if I have that song in my iTunes collection. So let's see what I have here. So the moment the uh, speaker uh, sees me looking at it, it'll show me what's currently on the uh, iTunes list, and currently the song is under pressure, so let's uh, forward to the next song here and then hit play because that's life on Mars. And now I get the uh, recorded version. Uh, so when I want to go back to my uh, Enjoy My Life show, all I need to do is simply orient myself to my display and hit the play button. All right, so there are other ways in which we can use attention, and that is to augment environments and augment the human brain itself. Here's a video of a system we did for uh, cubicles, which called the attentive office cubicle. All right, it's amazing. Wow, pretty good. <laughs> they demonstrated a scenario that's familiar to anyone who's ever tried to get some work done. No, it's not. Come on, I get friends. I never had. Distraction doesn't just delay the task at hand. There's a cost to brain power too. It interrupts your train of thought. You both, you're both that. best friends, you know, but I just happen to... Which isn't always easy to get back. You know, got, it's something like, called oh, recollective no intent. Out, you know? well, yeah, I'll make... The worker wears noise reduction headphones, which are also equipped with a marker on top, one that is read by an infrared camera in the ceiling. His colleague wears one, too. Their positions inside their cubicles are detected and mapped thanks to a special software. This is what's called their social geometry. When a colleague taps on the window, a slight click is heard in the worker's headphones. And he can decide whether to acknowledge it or not. If he does, he turns in his chair, a connection is made, and where there was once a wall, presto, it's now glass. Um, are you working on the paper? Yeah, I've been running it all morning, and uh, it looks, looks pretty good. And of course, we can amend so memory with that as well. We can have portable versions sensor. of these iconic sensors and, and record what you do. Camera receives eye contact when I'm receiving eye contact from an onlooker. This LED uh, series of infrared lights here produces a red eye effect in people's pupils, kind of like you have when you take a picture and there's sort of a red eye in, in the photograph that you don't want. Well, we take advantage of that. That eye contact triggers the camera to record the conversation. So I'm going to come up and speak with Rule and have a conversation with him. And and we're just going to make, make eye contact like we normally do when we talk with each other. And I'm just going to say a few things about... Uh, well, I, except I can't see your eyes because you're wearing shades, dude. Well, I, you can't see my eyes. Within seconds, video. the video appears on I, Connor's I own really blog. Like so this shows how iconic sensing technology can be completely wearable. But we can also do the inverse, uh, it turns out. We can track the eyes of the wearer. Um, and more or less get an idea of where this person is looking. Now, prior to this technology, it required a setup like this. And this is actually used by supermarkets uh, to see what shelves customers look at and to actually price out the shelves if, they're, if uh, customers are renting those shelves. Uh, this is very, very sturdy technology in that it has to be uh, really, really tightly placed on the head. If it shifts a little bit, your calibration is off and all your measurements are gone. What's cool about the viewpointer technology um, that I would like to, uh, to ask Jamie Hart, my, uh, my student, to, uh, to come demonstrate, is that it doesn't require any calibration whatsoever. Instead, when um, users look at a tag uh, using a camera that is essentially mounted on the head and that uh, looks at it from maybe a 45 degree angle or so, uh, we can still see that that tag appears in the center of the pupil, which is what you see here. Um, tags are very, very small. You basically stick a tag, it's got a battery in it, a couple of LEDs, and it beams a code that bounces off the cornea of the user into uh, a wearable computer, and then you simply record that, and you know what you've looked at throughout the day. This could be products, this could be anything, uh, or this could be interactive. And so what Jamie's going to uh, demonstrate to us is um, is how this technology might be used in order to uh, improve hearing aids. Jamie Hart. Hi. 
So this is the current version of the viewpoint camera that Roel was mentioning. Um, it's very lightweight, wraps around your head, and it's completely in my peripheral vision. So we wanted to think of a way that we could use this camera to kind of help out. There's a lot of research done with eye, content, eye tracking and assistive technology. So this is a slightly different approach. Um, a couple of stats on hearing impairment in general. Hearing impairment affects approximately 3.1 million people. Sorry, 31 million people. That's approximately 8% of the American population. Um, I think it's, this estimate is often underestimated in that you don't really see many hearing aids around, but it's greater than you think. Um, the major problem with hearing aids is that they amplify everything in your environment. So I was doing some research on this recently, and one lady I was speaking to actually said that she can't eat a bag of chips anymore because the crinkling noise from the bag is absolutely deafening. So it really does affect people's quality of life. Um, research has shown that the number one improvement requested by hearing aid users is better understanding of speech and noise. Um, as a result of this, it seems that most hearing aid users tend to simply avoid noisy environments, um, leading to depression and withdrawal behavior, antisocialness. Um, and studies have shown that the amount of noise, of background noise that hearing aid users can um, tolerate is a big indicator of how successful their hearing aids will be. So just a couple of the existing methods of dealing with background noise. The first is called personal FM systems. These are commonly used in environments such as churches or meeting rooms. Um, they work really well where there is one speaker and many listeners. The problem is if there's more than one speaker in the environment, there can be interference. And there are also some privacy concerns because anyone with a receiver can pick up what the speaker is saying. Um, second of all, we have digital noise reduction strategies. So these are frequency-based. So they basically eliminate any noise that's outside of the frequency range of human speech. Um, the problem is if the background noise is speech itself, they don't work, or if the noise is in the same frequency as speech, they don't work at all. Um, a third approach are directional hearing aids. So these just use directional microphones to amplify sounds coming from in front of the user. Um, the problem with these is that the sound from the, the desired sound from the speaker and the background noise have to be spatially separated. So in a restaurant environment, this wouldn't work very well because even though I'm looking at the person directly in front of me, I'll also be getting noise further back. Um, so this is the current system we have with a wearable computer. It's the attentive hearing aid, we've called it. And it is a wearable calibration-free eye contact sensor that detects users looking at small infrared tags in the environment. So the idea is that users can specifically target which sound source they want to listen to. So they could tag their spouse, they could tag their television, their radio, their, their doorbell, their alarm clock, anything in the environment that they want to listen to. And we're in the process of getting started on an evaluation to kind of compare the attentive hearing aid to some other methods out there. Thanks a lot, Jamie. So Jamie will be uh, demonstrating this technology right after the talk for anyone who's interested. So we live in a world of noise, and one of the questions we've been asking is how can we allow people to continue to focus within that world of noise? And I think it's time that we start designing computers such that they show attention, think attention, sense attention, broker attention, augment attention, in order to focus attention. I thank you very much for your attention. Oh, one more thing. Um, one more thing. There's a new worldwide market emerging that is a networked, ambient advertising market. It's a key growth market. In 2005, in the UK alone, there were 94,000 ambient advertising display units with a 63% growth per annum. We now have technology that allows us to sense whether users are interested in these ads so that we can sell advertisements by the eyeball, by the attention. And we can provide um, per view business model for advertising in the digital signage industry, um, very much like that exists online already. So essentially what we set out to do with a company called Zook is to do page rank for the real world, to measure the flow of attention of anything. And for this, 
uh, the spin-off has developed a revolutionary new eye tracking technology that we'll unveil today called iBox 2. And it's the world's longest range eye sensor. Um, it's got a 1.3 megapixel image sensor. It does 15 frames per second over a USB 2 connection and uh, a fairly lightweight computer uh, powers the computer vision. And it finds eyeballs at up to 10 meters distance. And it's available as of now uh, for $999. That's a factor 25 reduction in the cost of eye tracking. Associated with this technology is a viewing stats um, software package and website technology um, that is called Eye Analytics. And it allows us to basically track whether uh, users are interested in advertisers or not. And let me see, I'll go to that website. So what we're seeing here is um, analytic data. Not sure we're online here. Okay, we don't appear to be online. Um, and what I would like to demo um, at the end of my talk is um, the iBox technology. It's uh, standing right here. I need to make a couple of switches, and then uh, we can show you this exciting new eye tracker. So Jamie, if you would like to uh, stand over there. So what we see here is this eye box is tracking her from well over eight meters. And, and it can track as many people as you want. At no additional process or cost. So this, for the first time, makes eye tracking a reality for the real world. It allows walk up the use. Uh, kind of applications, and it allows advertisers to track hits on their advertisement, much like web pages can today. Thank you very much, Jamie. Yeah. Did you manage to get the uh, link up? I. Let's see how we're doing here. Okay, so what you see here is a website that a customer um, sees, and the customer is running ads at various locations and can essentially browse the statistics for that ad in various malls, in various um, locations. Um, so if I click uh, New York here, I can see the ads running only in New York. In this case, for this customer, there's two ads running. And I can see two vital statistics. I can see the number of people that are looking at uh, any particular day. And I can also see the average percentage of time that people are looking at that ad. And that's a percentage of the whole ad as it runs if it's a moving ad. Um, I can then go to a specific location and look at the day. And I can see very, very detailed statistics on attendance uh, of that advertisement at any particular moment in time. And what this allows us to do, for example, is migrate 
ads on a, a, a national network uh, to essentially chase wherever the people are. All right, with that, I would like to end uh, the talk. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance. And if you're interested, uh, we'll set up a demo for the attentive hearing aid. You can come uh, and have a closer look at that. Thank you very much.